Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Table Talk with Muqeem Mehmad. Today we are going to discuss environmental issues faced by the world. We have a distinguished guest today in our show, Samia al -Dwaj. She is from Kuwait. She has worked with United Nations, traveled all around the world, and she has expertise in environmental issues and solutions. Samia al -Dwaj, welcome to the show. Samia al -Dwaj, my first question to you is, the COP27 didn't show any ambition to phase out fossil fuels. How do you see, like, what is the outcome of it? You know, I don't think, um, as, uh, sadly, I don't think the outcome was as, as uh, satisfactory as many of the um, um, delegates had hoped. Um, you know, I mean, I come from an oil producing country and uh, I, I will have to admit that there was a lot of lobbying from the fossil fuel industry. Um, having the COP in the Middle East, you know, gave gave um, some of the some more more leverage, I, I would imagine, for for some of the major oil producing countries like uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia. So um, the the ambitions on the mitigation side, as compared to uh, Glasgow, were 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 limited. I mean, uh, you know, there were, even the language did not include phasing out, but you know, going for low yeah. emission energy which is what I think Saudi Arabia is trying to advance, which is um, this concept of um, circular carbon economy, which means sequestering and reusing the carbon. However, I mean, I'm skeptical because it, it, the technology is not advanced yet uh, to be um, um, to match the urgency of the situation. And um, it's, it's really expensive and the amount of carbon sequestered is not that much with current standards. However, more investment, more R&D can help. And this is for oil producing countries. But I think, you know, the writing is on the wall. I mean, you know, um, sadly, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, so on, have to come to terms with the, uh, the, the coming energy transition. I think their demand is uh, global. Yeah, there is another thing that Russia-Ukraine war has increased the use of coal throughout the world. How do you see the yeah. situation? You know, I think it's temporary. So well, if you speak to anybody from Europe, uh, the, you know, from the EU, um, you know, they've had to obviously um, go back to their, to, to um, you know, restart the, so their, their coal industry. But that is considered as a, as a temporary measure until they complete the transition. So what actually happened with the Russia-Ukraine is has accelerated the adoption of um, you know um, uh, renewable energy, even even in some cases nuclear energy and so on. So um, it's a it's a blip in the in the in the plan in the in the projected uh, transition. So I mean it's unfortunately you know you, people people now I mean Europe will face a cold winter. People need need to be need to. Um, Need to get their heating and they need to get their um, um, houses warm. So I think um, we shouldn't um, read too much into it. I think maybe next two three years we'll see an increase in coal consumption, uh, in general fossil fuel consumption, and it's expected that it will drop after 2025-2026. But we are assuming here that the war will end soon. One thing, and the second is. What are the impact of fossil, use of fossil fuel on our environment? I mean, um, you know, the, 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 I mean, the war is going to continue, and sadly, it doesn't seem like there's an end to this war, and there's no, there's no, um, no breakthrough in any kind of peace negotiations. However, um, the, I mean, it's uh, it's going to be like I said. So so in the end, you look at net emissions, and we need to have the, the EU has a target of, if I'm not mistaken, 40% reduction in emissions. So it'll just go up for a little bit and then go down. I mean, they are accelerating their transition to um, greener um, energy sources. Um, mm. But you know, it's a, it's a, sadly this is the this is the the price that we have to pay. I mean, for this. Really, I mean, in my opinion, uh, really unnecessary war. It's just brought nothing but misery to everybody. Okay, you come from Kuwait. 
and you have worked yeah. throughout the world on environment. Would you agree that Middle East is lagging on climate action? Um, yes, I mean, we are catching up quite quickly. I think you'll find that um, in the last uh, three, four years, um, the uh, new uh, leadership in uh, Saudi Arabia, I mean, even though they even though they they kind of um, obstruct in uh, in uh, cop meetings but there at least it used to be before just you know we're, we're fossil fuels and and this is our aim but at least now they're really serious about more sustainable sources of energy more sustainable uh, looking at renewables and, and and so on and egypt egypt's going to be a big 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 player in this field algeria morocco are already way ahead um, where I think is lacking in the, in the MENA region, I think the public perception still needs to come to terms. Because, um, so let's say, you know, uh, I mean, only now uh, governments are beginning to connect the dots and people are beginning to connect the dots. So in the GCC, it's, uh, you know, the average person lives very comfortably. But obviously we have migrant workers here who suffer in the heat. We have, you know, stateless people in Kuwait who don't get the same services as, as uh, you know, people within the um, urban area. And then also, but like countries like Iraq and Syria are really, really at the for, at the forefront of 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 the these massive impacts. And we're talking really extreme heat and drought. And because of the drought, we've we've had in, incredible dust storms. I mean, uh, this year. Um, I think five or six hundred people were hospitalized um, in the first dust storm in Iraq. Uh, in Kuwait, like I said, because obviously the infrastructure is better, so there are some respiratory health issues, but we're not feeling it as much as our neighbors because you know it's just the way that's the socioeconomic. So when you when you handle climate change, to, to to have a more resilient society, you need you need a functioning government. You need uh, um, a functioning system you need to put um some protections in place and so on so i i feel like um you know in terms of the heat and the and the drought and and the the crops uh, especially the agricultural countries like iraq like syria and so on they really feel impact egypt is um i think egypt or alexandria you know which is a main city in egypt they're already plan they're already anticipating several rise will probably um, and so on. So, yeah, I think I think the COP and the, having it in the Middle East, I think, has really um, shifted the public perception of what we need to do about climate change. Here is time for a break. We'll continue questioning after the break. Welcome back, Samia. My next question is: Samia, you have worked in Africa as well. What is your experience like uh, working there in, in the first place? And secondly, what is the understanding of climate change there? Um, my, my, my work in Africa was mostly like uh, in the, sort of the, the um, Horn of Africa, so Djibouti and, uh, and, like, and Sudan. Um, mm -hmm. No, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, Sudan, uh, Sudan is one of the most stressed countries in the world for, for many reasons, for conflict, for migration and so on and then Djibouti is the same and I think you know this is something that I don't think a lot of people in our region and then maybe I mean I think uh, this problem is more acute in Southeast Asia um, I think it's, it's more discussed which is climate refugees we in the middle with the Arab world or northern Africa or someone we still don't talk about that issue much but I think Sudan will will be one of the first countries to, to suffer from this issue so um, you will see in, uh, you know, it's, it's the same problems. It's a desert, desert uh, environment, you know, a lot of drought, a lot of dust, a lot of respiratory issues, um, you know, um, and then there's not, not a lot of sustainable practices within agriculture or water use or so on. So, you know, I mean, I think that, that water, I mean, I think, I think water security is going to be the next flashpoint for, for, our, for the Middle East after oil. Um, I think water is going to be our biggest problem. Recently, Pakistan suffered or was hit by heavy flooding because of the rain. Yeah. And they are still suffering from it. 
33 million people directly affected and estimation is that it's about 40 billion dollar loss to Pakistan. The world community has donated verbally 130 million. We st uh, they still need more than six, seven hundred million dollars. But we don't see world's response going to be helpful to Pakistan. How do you see it? I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a cynic when it comes to this because this is not the first disaster where the world the the world is pledged and hasn't uh, fulfilled their pledge. I mean, um, from 2009, there was supposed to be a a, a, a climate fund uh, with 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 a hundred billion uh, hundred billion uh, dollars donated every year uh, for adaptation and mitigation, and that hasn't come through. And then in emergencies, you've seen, you know, even across the world in Haiti, in Yemen, whatever, it's really hard to raise money. And I think, you know, the problem is with the, when I say that this war in Ukraine and Russia really, really has just completely um, changed the, the, everybody's perspective about what needs to be done. Uh, you know, this is not a, unfortunately, it's not a priority anymore. Uh, I think a lot of countries are having their own problems with the high cost of uh, gas, high cost of oil, and then high cost of food. Um, and that's, I think, why the pledges are not always, they don't always uh, get fulfilled, you know? I mean, us being, I mean, me being so close to a lot of conflict areas, you know, there was a lot of money pledged for Syria, for Lebanon to help with the refugees, whatever, and, you know, sadly, um, this is a problem in, with international aid in general, like, the pledges are one thing and the action is something else. Yeah. Sabia, another big conference is taking place within this week where 160 countries will uh, send their delegations or representatives. It's called United Nations Biodiversity Conference or COP15. Yeah. yeah. What are your expectations about it? So this this COP fifteen um, the the pledge here is to um, uh, what they want to do is is protect thirty percent. So each country would that um, commit to protecting thirty percent of its land for nature, and then thirty percent of the oceans, the world. Uh, uh, this is this is one of the main targets. I mean, you know, people are not yet. Um, optimistic only because, you know, uh, I think the link between climate change and biodiversity is not yet strong in, in, um, in, in many key um, decision makers' mind. Um, you know, it is connected because part of one of the ways you can mitigate uh, for climate change is you protect nature because obviously trees and, and rich biodiversity sequester and absorb carbon. So, um, the you know i mean we hope it works but then this other aspect that's happening now i think which is like so the, the world needs to start tapping into the private sector because there's trillions of dollars available in sustainable finance and so on it's just a matter of operationalizing it identifying the right projects and the right approaches because governments alone can't do it international organizations alone can't do it you need to get the private sector involved and you need to um i mean now a lot of companies are thinking about their carbon footprint and they're they're looking at their supply chain and how how it's impacted by climate how they impact their local environment and so on it's it's changing it's it's it's, it's changing quite a bit but that 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 connection between mobilizing all these funds from the private sector into the projects like this that's that's i think one of the things they will discuss in this cop how to invest in nature how to make it profitable and um, how to um, uh, tap into these huge funds available in the private sector you have worked in most part of the world you what was your most interesting project for you yourself Oh, um, I so in the last year I worked with uh, UNDP on um, uh, well, we're trying to put a plan together to prevent an oil spill from happening in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, 
there's a tanker called FSO Safar. It's been in the media quite a bit. And um, I was recruited as part of a team to put a contingency plan uh, for oil spill response. I worked a little bit on oil spills, but not to this extent. So it was really interesting. It involved a lot of travel uh, to Yemen, and I've never traveled to a, a, like in conflict area. Um, so that was a real eye opener, you know, just going to with a UN convoy and how, you know, and the armed 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 uh, escorts and uh, going to a war zone and whatever that was quite challenging and it's also very very rewarding because you know uh, kuwait and yemen uh, we really have a very very close relationship as 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 countries and as as societies and as people and um i i, I was really 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 um um just blown away by the generosity and the spirit and the resilience of the Yemeni people and their um, amazing welcome for me. I mean, it was really, even with their, despite their situation, despite the war, despite the conflict, you know, you hear, you can sometimes hear air raids and so on, but uh, the people of Yemen are really the most resilient and most amazing uh, people ever. They really just get on with it, you know, and they're so kind and they're so welcoming and generous. So that was, I think, one of my really interesting projects that I worked on. So yeah, what would be your message to our viewers um, regarding environment and biodiversity? Um, when we talk about environment, we're talking about uh, public health in the end, right? You know, you, you, nobody wants to breathe dirty air. No one wants to breathe, you know, drink or swim or whatever in dirty water or polluted water. Um, I would just say, you know, do what you can at home. Um, just think about your uh, what, what you can. If you reduce, you reduce plastic, you reduce your food waste and so on. Think, think carefully about your, what you can do at home. But also, you know, talk about it. Talk about this issue. I think in Pakistan, you probably, it is probably a headline. It's all, uh, this issue is in the headlines because of, you know, the, the, the tragedies that, have, that many of the, many, uh, many people have suffered from the flooding and even previously the heat waves and so on. Um, and, you know, um, just um, call, um, hold your politicians to account, you know? I mean, if they're not doing anything, um, you know, don't vote for them again if you care about this issue. So um, make it a priority for the, for the country. Just, you know, just engage in it all the time because this is affecting everybody. Good. Thank you very much, Samia, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, this was today's show where Samia Dwej talked about the environmental issues faced by the world. I hope you would like it and I will see you in the next episode of Table Talk with Mokhi Mehman. Goodbye.